what are the what are the causes of depression rather than what are the symptoms um, do the symptoms actually help the individual overcome the depression um, and so just identifying the evolutionary reasons why we have certain symptoms i'm adam hunt and this is the evolving psychiatry podcast rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens share it with the people who matter like it if you like it subscribe if you want to hear more Dr. Severi Luoto is a researcher at the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences in the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He's done research into evolutionary developmental psychology, biological psychology, cultural evolution, cognitive psychology, behavioral neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and the evolutionary developmental origins of health and disease. Uh, he's a co-author with Marcus Rantala on the chapter we're going to be discussing today, uh, titled Evolutionary Perspectives on Depression. Obviously in the Cambridge University Press volume, um, so thank you, Severi, for joining me. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, so it's a fascinating chapter. Um, I love it. And I love the paper that it was sort of based on from 2018 that you also co-authored with Marcus. Um, so in the chapter, you begin by noting that some types and symptoms of depression are adaptive, uh, whilst others are maladaptive. Um, and you kind of point out that, that depressive symptoms can really differ between different individuals. Uh, and we re really shouldn't be thinking of depression as a single thing, the sing single cause. And you give this very extensive and, and excellent list of 12 kind of quite specific different causes of depression from an evolutionary perspective, which I thought I'd just kind of list now to kick off. Uh, and so they are infection, long term stress, loneliness, uh, traumatic experience, hierarchy conflicts, grief, romantic relationship dissolution, um, postpartum events seasons, chemicals, somatic diseases, and starvation. Uh, so if anyone, if people want more detail on all of these specifically, they can look to your chapter or your 2018 article where you introduce them. I wonder if just for us now, you could pick out a couple of these subtypes that you think are particularly interesting and talk about how the symptoms of depression relate to them. Um, yeah, I think it's feasible to start with infection because that's kind of the principal component here. And that relates to how uh, systemic low-grade inflammation is related to the onset of uh, depression symptoms. So with uh, depression stuff, uh, that is in induced by infection, uh, infection actually causes all kinds of biochemical changes in the body, as, as most of us know by now with COVID-19, right? Uh, so it causes fatigue, anhedonia, things of this nature. And these symptoms, essentially, they evolved to change our behaviors uh, when we're infected by a pathogen or by a virus so that we conserve energy for the immune system to help fight the cause of the illness. So in this case, pathogens or viruses. And so in that sense, it makes sense to identify the specific subtype of depression. If it's induced by infection, if it's long-term infection, then it might induce a long-term inflammation in our body, which then also prolongs the symptoms of depression. But then what makes this interesting is that we actually have, um, or not all of us, but quite a few people in the modern era have um, low-grade systemic inflammation in their bodies, even without infection. So even without an infection by mm. a specific parasite or pathogen. And this, uh, this low-grade inflammation is, is typically caused by unhealthy uh, lifestyles. So things like Western diet that has high amounts of caloric surplus has poor macronutrients. So a lot of fat, a lot of sugar, but few micronutrients. So a few things that help um, reduce inflammation, a lot of things that actually increase inflammation. And obesity is known to be associated with inflammation as well. And so when we have low-grade systemic inflammation on bodies, that actually tends to increase the symptoms of depression, that tends to make us more susceptible to developing clinical depression uh, when we have such adverse life events as hierarchy conflict or romantic relationship dissolution. So this, this bio biological mechanism of the body of having this low-grade systemic inflammation in the body, uh, the way it interacts with adverse life events, and then that's, that's the key part where mm. adaptive short-term mood changes can lead to more clinical or more long-term depression. And that's, that's an interesting subtype. And that's kind of the, the key, I think, to thinking about the whole bi biology and evolution as well of uh, depression behavior in humans. So you have these um, 
these experiences of uh, grief or status loss or um, you know romantic relationship dissolution and because we're living in a particular way uh, like a particular society and it's you know and there's various stressors including diet as you mentioned um, then then these then the low mood is more likely to turn into something that's that's chronic and and like an actual kind of major depressive disorder is the point yeah exactly so we think of these more changes as being adaptive in the short term so the way we react to things like romantic relationship dissolution or higher conflict the way in which we react to them initially can be adaptive so we mm. might have anhedonia we might uh you know lower our expectations with regards to the future we might lower our standards when it comes to um potential potential mates so we accept someone who doesn't meet our previous standard or standards mm. and thereby we lower our expectations towards the environment but when we combine that with this low-grade systemic inflammation uh then it's far more likely to lead to clinical depression that is long term and it ceases then to be adaptive at some point mm. um because it's combined with this maladaptive state of the body right so you note that this is likely a fairly um, new or at least much more common um, phenomena in modern society uh, and so yeah this this low mood um that that might have kind of arisen as an adaptive response in our hunter gatherer ancestors uh, will turn into major depressive disorder today and is now clinically diagnosable um so so you've talked a little bit about the major differences um of, of diet um could you talk a little bit more about uh what what do you think um what these mismatches are apart from that um you know what what, what happens to people that, that puts them in these kind of low mood and depressed states yeah that's a good question so we also have chronic stress in contemporary environments and that's caused by uh, all kinds of factors related to environmental pollution um just the complexity like the sheer complexity of modern environments right it's mm. there's so many options in the world we we have like a handheld device the size of a the stone age hand axe right and we have connections <laughs> to um essentially all of the knowledge that humankind has ever produced and millions of people we have access to millions of people and co connections to social connections that just proliferate because of mm -hmm. this modern technology we have things of this nature we have just the, the sheer amount of mismatch that we have between the complexity of the current environment and the relative simplicity of uh, of our en environment of evolution adaptiveness that kind of complexity can cause um peers chronic stress um then there are all kinds of things all kinds of other things like the sedentary lifestyle so we as we move we that that works as a stress relief um mm -hmm. mechanism and if we have sedentary lifestyles our entertainment is <laughs> via computers or phones um or tvs so we don't get that kind of dopamine rush or that kind of stress release that we would get if we had a more ancestral or a lifestyle that was more typical of our ancestral environment mm -hmm. so th these kinds of things are related to chronic stress which is then uh, also um, it precipitates low-grade inflammation obviously when we're sedentary we have higher obesity we have more fat tissue in the body which uh, is um, related to the onset of inflammation and the onset of depression as we know there's a bi-directional link between obesity and, and depression so yeah that's uh, and we also know that um, obesity is an evolutionary novelty as well isn't it so right. we don't have any hunter gatherers who had the ability to become obese because just the, the difficulty of uh, of extracting resources from the environment and the amount of difficulty that it took to actually uh, extract the, those those resources mm -hmm. through energy expenditure and through mobility through um the the environment in which they lived right they're constantly moving around and, and yeah it, it, every aspect of our life is just very uh bizarre and, and kind of yeah almost made to to be slightly depressing i suppose um and then to to be depressogenic and, and exactly. i mean yeah this is this is what people often note you know they might have had some moderate depressed feelings and then you know to get pushed into major depressive disorder they've been living this very kind of strange modern life and then something bad happens you know like a, a relationship breaks up and then that's the thing that kind of pushes you over the edge and but if but yeah if a relationship broke up in a in a hunter gatherer society then you'd be in a very different kind of physical situation and also a, a social situation which is probably uh, more conducive to finding you know new mates or, or whatever it is um that's that's a good point because we could also make the point that loneliness as we see it in contemporary environments it's something of an evolutionary novelty in that hunter-gatherer right. groups were 
they were smaller than, than modern crews, but they were also more tightly knit. So you always had, or in most cases, you, you had a support network, which might be lacking in contemporary societies where we, we are more individualistic, especially in Western societies, more individualistic. And you know, we've, most of us have seen this during COVID-19 where we had lockdowns and how that made us feel, uh, mm-hmm. how that sense of isolation where you didn't have those social bonds and social connections with you uh, all the time. I think that's kind of concrete demonstration of the importance of, of uh, social connections to well-being. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I love this subtyping approach that you go through in your paper in the chapter. I think it's really important and uh, yeah, to think of the, the natural triggers for low mood and then, and, you know, why those would exasperate into a major depressive disorder. I think it's a really huge contribution to evolutionary psychiatry. So uh, thank you for that. And I think we really need to do it more with anxiety and, and all the other disorders too. Um, well, it happens a little bit with anxiety, I suppose, but not as much as it should be. Um, so finally, this is, you know, the big question that uh, always hangs over our heads when we're talking about mental disorders. Um, how how do you think this research, how do you think this perspective uh, should affect how we think about treating and preventing depression? Um, you know, if we want to relieve this burden, it's, it's complicated, but uh, is there anything... Uh, is there anything useful that we can do here? Yeah, no, that's that's really important. Um, and it's I, I would say it's a conversation opener and it's a paradigm shift in many ways. You know, if current treatment of depression is focused on potentially identifying and treating potential um, imbalances of neurotransmitters in the brain, rather than looking at the whole state of the body, like, rather than looking at the whole psychological, biological state of the body and of the individual, um, what are the what are the causes of depression rather than what are the symptoms? Um, do the symptoms actually help the individual overcome the depression? Um, and so just identifying the evolutionary reasons why we have certain symptoms, how might those symptoms be adaptive, maladaptive, or neutral in, in contemporary environments, mm-hmm. uh, and how we can address the causes of each specific um, episode of depression uh, and whether that falls under the depression subtypes, uh, I think that really helps to identify the causes, uh, tackle the causes rather than just myopically trying to fix the symptoms, mm-hmm. like just putting a Band-Aid uh, over a wound rather than um, identifying the, way, you know, the ways in which that wound came about in the first place. So right. I, think, I, I think that's the major, major contribution, opening, opening up the floor for discussion, a bit of a theoretical paradigm shift. Uh, and you know, essentially, it's, it's not... It's, it's not a finished topic. It's still something sure. that we have to work on, uh, not only us, but other researchers as well. I'm sure they will refine and define and further experiment with these subtypes that we have proposed. And then hopefully we'll have a more refined and more intelligent way to tackle this um, epidemic of depression. Right. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, when you, when you read through the subtypes that you provide, you can totally see how there will be specific sort of interventions, whether it's therapy or, you know, actual just life interventions, or sometimes, you know, maybe antidepressants are more effective in certain cases where you really, um, you know, there's nothing that you can change in your life and you just have to get through a period of six months where you're going to sure, go through a hard sure. time, you know, uh, yeah, having that nuance. And it's not only differences between individuals, but also differences within individuals. So an individual can have a number of different subtypes throughout their lives, even at the same time. So mm-hmm. identifying not only between individual differences, but also within individual differences, I think that mm-hmm. will help tackling the specific uh, episodes of depression that any given individual will go through at any given point in their lives or um, whether there are also individual differences in, in depression etiology is also another question. And then we have to look at things like chronic stress and infl- inflammatory biomarkers and things of this nature to get to a more sophisticated understanding of the biopsychosocial causes of depression. Right. I think this is uh, really, really excellent stuff. And, you know, for the people out there who've experienced depression or know people with depression, this probably rings rings true to some extent. And, it, and that, you know, I think it does make sense of our, you know, our suffering uh, in this kind of deeper way that, you know, will eventually lead to treatment. And, you know, and this is the beginning of it. So, uh, so thank you so much for your, for your chapter and your paper. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful Thanks. talking to you today. Thanks for the chat, Adam. I look forward to seeing where all of this leads in the future. Cheers.